Welcome to another episode of GLS. With me today, I have the pleasure of speaking with the number two ranked Bellator flyweight in the women's division. She's also a former Marine, Liz Carmouche. How do you do? Good, good. How are you? Not too bad. So we can catch Liz back in action on Friday versus Kana Watanabe, which is, is down to be a banger for sure. Um, you can follow her on Instagram at I am Gorilla, which is one of the dopest names I've seen on Instagram. Is there anything else that you would like people to check out, social media, anything at all? Uh, yeah, I'm also on Facebook, Liz Carmouche Official, and Twitter also as I am. Okay, cool. So let me tell you a little bit about my podcast. I primarily interview fighters, jujitsu, wrestlers, but I also, as a former Marine, I like to give uh, a little bit of a spotlight to the active duty and the veterans as well. So with you being both, you're kind of like a double whammy for me because, you know, <laughs> professional fighter and ex-Marine. So it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's an honor to get to talk to you with this. Thank you. So the first question I like to ask all my Marine friends, you know, we're in a country that has a lot of different options. You could have gone Navy. You could have gone Air Force. You could have gone Coast Guard. Why the hell did you choose the Marines? Uh, a few different reasons. I, I lived in Okinawa, Japan growing up, and I got to, and I worked on the military basis, so I got to see all the different branches. I lived on different bases, so I got to see what that was like, too, and I got to see them not only when they were in uniform and supposed to be exemplifying their service and who they were, but also outside of that, who they were in their lifestyle with their families. And the one that stood out by far through and through every time was always Marines, whether it was if, like, one of them got too drunk and one of their buddies threw him in a taxi and was like, no way, took him back. And you never saw evidence of it where I see like other branches be super sloppy, do something really reckless out and about, or whether it even be on base, just holding themselves to the standards, going out there and thrashing themselves during personal training. Um, it was just always, every time it was always the Marines that stood out above everybody else. And the uniforms look way better than everybody else. So I was like, hey, this is an easy one. <laughs> right, right. And did you have any family that was prior service as well that kind of influenced that decision? Or were you like first generation? No, my father is in the Air Force, um, and so I'd like to, I got to see that that part of it, and definitely was like, yeah, they kind of just like coast on a, a bicycle for their, their physical fitness test. That's not really for me. And these guys will eat donuts and can't run ten feet. <laughs> right. So was there a lot of like I don't know if to say like shock or like you know like the fact that you wanted to go the the Marine Corps route instead of the Air Force Navy? Was there any pushback from your decision? Uh, so my parents separated and I, I lived with my mom from a really young age. And uh, so there was some pushback from her just in that she at the very least wanted me to go officer route. She's like, just stay in school. You'll have better options if you go officer. And please, of all things, don't go Marine Corps. Go Navy. Go Air Force where they're going to treat women better. Don't do not do the Marine Corps. And I'm like, sorry, this is the only way I see it going. And I, I can't be in college any longer than I am. One quarter of it's done. Yeah. <laughs> So of all, I myself, me and my fiance that we met in the Marine Corps, we were both stationed in Okinawa for two years on Camp Kinzer. That's where that's where we spent the majority of our time together. I went to the Philippines and then I finished my time off in a New River Air Base in Jacksonville. Of, yeah. of all the places that they've sent you, what has been some of your favorite locations and what have, has been some of your least favorite places? Uh, so I wasn't as fortunate with other people to get moved around a lot. Um, I did all my time at Camp Pendleton. And so it was either Camp Pendleton or it was Iraq. Those are the only two options. I didn't get to go to Afghanistan. I didn't go on any underways, muse, anything like that. Uh, I went to school in North Carolina and uh, I went to school in South Carolina and both those places, I didn't have a car, I didn't have an li American license, so I didn't have the availability to go out and drive and stuff. Mm -hmm. And I just turned 21, so it was really just getting wasted in my barracks room, <laughs> doing crazy stuff like that. Uh, Camp Pendleton is really what hooked me, it was San Diego. It was everything that I've been looking for. I mean, when you see, when you're a kid that grows up overseas and you see movies about the United States and Los Angeles and the beach and surfing, things like that, it's like, wow, this looks really cool. And it just, it embodied all the cultures. It had everything there from all the different foodie appeal that you could have to uh, different ethnic backgrounds. And it just seemed all encompassing and all inviting for everybody. And that was a hook, line, and sinker for me with San Diego. Okay. And during your time, I'd like to know, this is a bit of a private question, but I remember when I was in the fresh into the fleet, I believe maybe two or three months into the fleet is when two like kind of big things happen in the Marine Corps. One, like sleeves could be rolled down. So we no longer had to, had to roll sleeves for a little bit. It came back eventually. 
but mm-hmm. it was it sleeves got to be rolled down and there was the repeal of the don't ask don't tell so I know you you've always been outspoken about you know being openly gay and like your support for the LGBT community but how difficult was it during those times when you, you weren't allowed to say anything because it could potentially ruin your career it was super difficult. I, I was a late bloomer, so I didn't actually come out. So I was 22. That's when the light bulb moment happened. And I had been in the Marine Corps for two years at that point. So you can imagine doing a five and a half year, five and a half year stint with them and two years into it discovering, oh no, this is why like, I don't want to go on dates with guys and I don't want them to hold my hand. This all makes sense now. Um, and it was really difficult, especially because my command was known for going on a witch hunt and being very against the LGBTQ community. I mean, one of the staff sergeants that were, that I worked for said that on the weekends, he and his wife would go out to Hillcrest and try and catch people and report them. Which now I also look at it as people thought he was a swinger and then he and his wife were like, so it's probably he was not in Hillcrest doing that. He was probably on another agenda, but put that out there so people saw them. Now I can, I can realize that. But that time I was scared shitless. That was a really scary concept and continually looking right back. At one point, I was under investigation because uh, they suspected I had a girlfriend and I had a motorcycle and just like all these other things. So I was always looking over my shoulders, wondering at any moment, at what moment I was going to get busted. I remember when they repealed it and it was like overnight, you could feel like the morale changed because there was there was people that could finally be themselves. And they weren't, you know, not just hiding it, but the fact that their career could also be affected was such a it's such a crazy thing to think about that 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 was something that they would like actually ruin your career for not not because you were a shit bag and you know like you went a wall or you stayed off base before after curfew or you know something like that no this is like something that was personal and they were coming at you guys for this and have you talked to any marines that were kind of like from i guess my generation when they were kind of finally able to be themselves in public yeah, I had some friends that were in and are still in. And so they were in before Don't Ask, Don't Tell during when it was it was uh, coming out. And then now they're still in. So to see the change in their lives, because I can remember talking to some of my friends that were staying in as I was hearing about the news. I'm like, hey, there's a potential where you wouldn't get in trouble. There's no risk. They can't ruin your career anymore. And that was honestly the biggest concern for a lot of us is we were good Marines. We had meritorious promotions, Navy comms, all these things going in our favor. And the one like bad mark on our record that could ruin our entire career would be this, was a choice that we didn't even really have to make, you know? Um, And so asking them like, hey, even if if this really goes through and there's no longer don't ask, don't tell, would you come out? And they're like, no, I still won't. Like just because there won't be repercussions per se, that doesn't mean that we're not going to be blacklisted by our company, but there, there won't be people that we work for. They're not going to treat us poorly. Like it, it's not going to change anything for us. And now to watch them years pass, be openly out is amazing to see because the fear that they were experiencing and saying like, I'll never come out. It doesn't matter. Even if this gets overturned, is not change anything. Some of the people that were joining at that time, they're like, I'll join now because this is going to be overturned and now I can be out. I can be who I am. So it's just so crazy to see some of the people experiencing different levels of it and then where they're at today. Okay. You're right. My next question here deals with McMap. Now for people who are watching that don't know what McMap means, you know, it's Marine Corps martial arts program. I got to know what belt were you? And were you just like whooping people's asses left and right, just taking arms and limbs or how was your experience with McMap? Uh, two things with McMap. One, having now actually really trained combat sports, I realized just how much of a joke McMap is, and it's really sad. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> it empowers all these young Marines to think that they're badass and go fight people. And I would see them like getting like just be out in town, and I'm just enjoying some boba and like watching. There was like a spot where we would go to, and it was in particular where these Marines would get out and think they're tough and start fights. So you just go there and you're like. All right, this is going to be really interesting, entertaining for a Friday night because I'm not going to go out and be crazy. Is these dumb Marines go out and they're like, "Yeah, I'm be, I'm a tan belt McMap. Now I'm going to go out there and fight somebody." And you're like, "Oh, this is so great!" <laughs> and thrown in the back of a taxi. Who knows where that kid's going? I uh, my command wouldn't let me train McMap. I ever requested, especially when they started saying that in order for you to advance and to get promoted, you had to advance in your McMet program or you could be, uh, say, a corporal, a sergeant, whatever. It had to match. And my command's like, no, the McMet's stupid. It is not relative for what you're doing. You're an electrician. That's all we care about. We spent way too much money in, for school. 
meanwhile, my male counterparts weren't necessarily held to that same standard. They were allowed to go do that stuff. Um, but I was fortunate in that in my last tour to Iraq is I was attached to a unit and they're like, what do you mean you haven't been doing map map training? Yeah, come train with us. I'm like, yeah. They're like, well, we'll do our best to get you belted, do everything that you need to do on the train. I'm like, I would let me go as far as I possibly can. I'd love to do this. And so I had a blast. There was a guy there who I want to say was a brown or black belt in jiu-jitsu. There was a guy that was a golden glove boxer. So there's different people that were teaching us things that were the real fundamentals that would make a difference. And so I ended up having a lot of fun just trying to figure out jiu-jitsu, having no idea what I was doing. I ended up, thankfully, with their help, getting my green belt. And, and that's how I left was I, I wanted to get all the way up to black belt. And I think had things been different, I'd been treated differently without a doubt. That's what would happen. But because of my command, it was one of those things where I slowly going up. And then finally in a short span of like two months got belted very quickly. Okay. And here's my problem with McMap. You know, a lot of the things, everything that the Marine Corps does is supposed to be to get you ready for combat. Now, every time that I was in a McMap session, whether it was just training or sparring, the instructor always did this thing with the women where it was like, women can only go with women. And it was like yeah. this weird, like overprotective, I don't know if to call it sexist, but it yeah. comes off as, as such because you're, you're saying like the women aren't strong enough or good enough to train with the men. But I've always viewed it as like, if you're in combat, the one thing on this planet that isn't sexist, racist, or bigoted is a damn bullet or your enemy. And yeah. they don't, they're not going to care if you're a man, a woman, or whatever you are. Like, you need, to, you need to train these women to like, you know, roll with men and all this other stuff. But it was like, they always had like these weird little like ways of protecting everybody around them. And there's always this thing with favoritism in the Marine Corps that yeah. is also a big problem. So... <laughs> That, that, that at least was my beef with McMap, and I'm glad that you kind of like somewhat saw the same thing. So it's, it's nice. So, all right, um, let's see. If you're, if I'm not mistaken, you EAS in 2009, and that's, you started uh, professionally in 2010? Yes. Yeah, so I EAS uh, February, or, uh, December 29th, 2009, and I started training January 1st, 2010. <laughs> Okay. And when, what was your, your thought process when you know it was time to put in those EAS papers and how much of it was influenced by like your fighting aspirations? Um, very little was actually with fighting. Um, I hadn't really trained the way that I wanted to just because my command, like I said, wouldn't let me do a lot of things and there's a lot of restrictions. It was really a lot of feeling like I went above and beyond to be the best Marine I possibly could. And it didn't matter because I was a woman. And just the, the MOS that I was in, I did not want to be an electrician. Like when I went into it, I told my recruiter, hey, whatever you do, like I swear to the highest ASVAB score you can get. He's like, you can do whatever MOS you want. Perfect. I want to do counterintelligence. You can't do that. I want to do recon. You can't do that. I'm like, okay, well, what can I do? So he laid out a list. And one of them was um, aviation technician. I didn't know. And he didn't tell me that underneath that was electrician. And I said specifically, like, hey, whatever it is, just I want a job where I'm going to be. I'll never set foot on the same place twice. I'm constantly moving. By just doing my job, I naturally get a workout, and I see new things around the world. That's all I'm asking for, and nothing with electricity. Of course, like most people, I, I got that the raw end of that deal, and I was an electrician. And when I was coming to my EAS state, I asked, like, okay, I want to be able to go to school. I want to be able to, to get my degree while I'm in. So I have the option that if I want to go and I want to be an officer at the end of this or a warrant officer, I can, or at the very least, just to have that skill set in my back pocket and just to do that. I want to either live in the NCO barracks because I was, a, I was getting out as a sergeant, but I was living in the non-NCO barracks and they wouldn't let me live in the NCO barracks for whatever reason. Not sure. I'm like, okay, so I either want, I want to live out in town, be on my own. I'm a grown woman. I know how to pay my bills. Let me live out in town. I wanted a school and I wanted different MOS. They couldn't guarantee any of those things. Like we can't do any of those. Like we can give you a very small signing bonus. I was like, yeah, that's, I don't, it, it's not about the money. It's about these three things. I want to know that I'm getting out of this with what I agreed to, which was that I was, I wanted to do my time and get a degree. And I, I made the rank of Sergeant and I did, I did that in very sure. I went from Lance Corporal to Sergeant in a very small window of time, just like with my, my tan belts. Once I got away from my, my main unit, everything went up from there. It was really just being held back by them. And so I'm like, oh, I'm asking for these three things. And they just like, I'm sorry, we just, we can't guarantee any of that. And with don't ask, don't tell still being active, 
is like, well, I'm miserable and I'm hiding every day and you can't guarantee me just three things. I'm not asking for more money. I want an MOS to actually be happy with and that I can excel. And being an electrician isn't it. I, I hate this command <laughs> and they don't like me either. And so they couldn't guarantee that as, as difficult as it was a decision for me. Uh, I just, I knew that I had to be true to myself and I had to get out. I, it's crazy because my father, he's also um, ex-Marine. He did 22 years. And oh, wow. we always talk about like, you know, his time in and my units. And he always tries to give me the, like the point of view of like, not every unit is the same. And that's, that's what I keep kind of learning. Cause I had the bad luck that I, my unit in Oki was terrible. And then I went to my unit in New River, which was, eh, it was a little bit of an upgrade, but not that much better. And that kind of ruined my Marine Corps experience. But, you know, it, it is right what he's saying. Like, sometimes the unit can make or break a Marine. And that's like, it's a sad thing to say. Yeah, and it wasn't just the unit because my my third my third tour to Iraq, it was complete change of command. My first command, uh, they were all right. Second command was absolutely horrible. We had a master sergeant that had somehow his entire career skated ever deploying to a combat zone, going from schoolhouse to drone charger to any way he could get around it, never deploying, which to me as a master sergeant, if I'm on my second deployment and you're experiencing your first yeah. at that rank, that's absolutely ridiculous. You're skating the system. And then he was so stuck on these old schoolhouse ways of wanting people to have inspection uniforms and uh, a clean front area in the desert, like sweep the desert, the sand's going to blow back in. Yeah, it's ridiculous. Right. Uniform inspections when we have no way of actually maintaining our uniform to keep it clean because we don't have a cleaning service. Like just all these standard things were absolutely ridiculous and I, I wouldn't make weight when I was in the Marine Corps I couldn't make weight because I was super muscular and my idea was if somebody in my unit gets injured I need to have the ability to carry that person to safety and never be the weak link so I was like I'll be as strong as I possibly can which meant that I walked around like 160 jacked mm -hmm. and my weight center I think was like 145 or 150 which now I totally know how to do that differently at the time I didn't you know I wasn't good on nutrition but I go in and they measure me for tape. And it's like, yeah, you know, your neck is huge and you have a six pack. And it's like, yeah, I'm shredded. So how can you say I'm not making weight? And like, meanwhile, this guy next to me, he's overweight. He can't run to the side and back. Mm -hmm. I can sprint 50 times before he makes it five feet. Like, how does this make any sense? Uh, and so it's just things like that. And that second command really, that left a horrible taste in my mouth. It, it was really that one. The third command, they were amazing. We had a gunny who I was in, I was a schoolhouse instructor and he remembered me he's like i tell stories about you about you doing the first class pft for females and then getting up there and showing the guys that you can knock out as many pull-ups as they can They're like whoever does the most i'll do more than him and just to prove a point you do your max and then go do their max it was he's like i always tell these stories about your your desire to be in the top three percent above men and women just the top three percent of everybody and everything that was always my goal and so when he came out, he's like, I remember you because I'm still telling stories about you in the schoolhouse. Why, why aren't you a corporal? Why aren't you a CDI? Why aren't you this? I'm like, Hey man, he's like, it doesn't, he's like, I'm looking on paper, on perfect, on paper, you're a perfect Marine. It doesn't make any sense. Your room is excellent. Every time your uniform inspections, excellent. Every time it's like, I don't get it. I'm like, I was born with breasts. What can I say? I'm a woman. That's the only, the only thing that differentiates me from this guy who's a shit bag. And he's a higher rank. So thankfully for him, he stood up for me and he helped me get promoted. He saw all the things that I needed to do to, to be better. And he was great. Like him seeing things differently. He's like, you're going to run the shop. He's like, I know she know what to do. I'm like, what? Dude, I just got promoted to corporal. And he's like, yeah, you got this. So I ran it, I ran it, took care of my Marines. And he's the one that made it hard because my second deployment, I was like, I'm done. This is it. Um, I'm never, to, I don't want to have anything to do with it. I'm going to get out before the third deployment. I'm not going to extend with these people. Um, I've given everything to them. They've given me nothing in return. I refuse to help them. And because of him, like, man, Gunny, think now because of you, I'm going to extend and I'm going to go out to Iraq and return to make sure you guys have this because you're a great guy and you've taken care of me. I want to take care of you guys too. And then on top of that, one of the majors in the unit is like, hey, we have this Lioness program. Who would you recommend? I'm like, me. I would be the best example of anybody you can send. I'll, I'll exemplify. I promise you, I will graduate top in that class and I will make this command look good. You want to send me the line of spray. There's not other female in this unit that'll make you guys look as good as I can. Send me. I want to do that. And sure enough, I graduated on the second of my class. And then when I went and I got to choose everything, when I went out to the unit and I did the line S program, they're like, yeah, we want to keep her. They had never extended any female ever. And they kept me for another month. 
So it's just like all these things are like, yeah, we want her to get married. She deserves to get meritoriously promoted, but because of it, they I wasn't technically under them, so they couldn't do that. So it's just like all these things are like, you guys are making it really hard for me to to not get out. Mm-hmm. And I, I know that like that was one experience. I had spent four years, almost five years in at that point, having nothing but negative experiences. And then these occurrences of people were small incidents that were good experiences. And I was like, I can't guarantee. And so when I asked them, like, can you guarantee that I can meet more people like this? Because if you guys can give me more people like this, I'll absolutely stay in without a doubt because I'm a Marine and that's why I picture myself. I'm like, but if it's going to be this group like this all the time, I'm not doing it. And they're like, yeah, it's going to be more people like that. We can't guarantee. So I was like, all right, then I can do it now. <laughs> right. Yeah, of course. So, I mean, I got, I got, I do got some MMA questions, but I love talking to Marines about stuff like this. And I would love to get your opinion on, you know, now that women are being allowed into the infantry, which is another like landmark that you could say recently happened. What was that? Like, was it three years ago? Three, four years ago, I, I believe. I, I, I know, see. Yeah. I, I, I believe the most recent platoon, like finally graduated. So how do you yeah. feel about, about women finally being integrated into the infantry? Uh, I see good and bad. You know, um, having done the Lioness program, I do, whether you want, I mean, we are hardwired a certain way and men's natural reaction is to protect a woman, right? So when it comes into the, and that's my biggest, my two biggest issues is that one, they're going to lower standards for women because they're not, not strong enough to do this or they can't do that. I can't, don't know. This is the standard across the board. There should be no change. Same thing with pull-ups. Women can't do pull-ups, then they shouldn't be in. I'm sorry. I can do 25, 30 pull-ups. You can too. If you can't do that, then you're not holding yourself to a standard that's, that needs to be met. I don't think the infantry, I don't think special forces, I don't think anything should lower their standards to include women. If women can't make it, they can't make it. It's that simple. And not everybody agrees with that. But I, in no way do I ever think that they should lower standards. If women can make it, awesome. Power to you. Absolutely do it. And I do think there are women capable, but not if it's going to be a lowering standards at all. I'm with you. 100%. That, that's, that's how I felt because it's like I said earlier, when you're in combat and the bullet doesn't give a doesn't give a fuck if you're a man, woman, how much you weigh, what you believe in, a bullet's a bullet. And that's what it was put there to do. So this lowering of the standards is really, it's messing with, especially with how the world is like in such conflict. Like why would we want our military to be weaker or like lower than let's say China's or Russia's when something could pop off eventually someday? God forbid, but you never know. Yeah. But all right, well, we'll see. We'll see how they do because uh, the, there's a lot of things that I see changing in the current Marine Corps. From you know, now we're also getting like you know the trans Marines that are also starting to get a seat at the table, and things are changing for them. You know, women in, in the infantry and in combat. So it's going to be an interesting next couple of years to see how the Marine Corps does with everything. Yeah. So all right, let's switch gears real quick to MMA. So. You've been fighting for Bellator now. Uh, this is going to be your third fight. Um, I've, I've heard some people make a comment like, oh, she's resurrected her career in Bellator. But for me, I feel like resurrection implies that something is dead. And your career was like the furthest thing from dead. I mean, like you look at your career and it's been nothing but, you know, world champions. It's been nothing but, you know, top, what, like top three, top four, top two contenders in the world every time. Do you feel like people kind of forget what you've done in MMA and how, like how successful your career has been? Yeah, I think sometimes they do. They don't realize that even um, when they look at people like Lucy Pudilova, Jennifer Maya, they look at these people and, and Vanessa Porto and they're like, oh, okay, well, they weren't ranked in the UFC. They weren't ranked in Bellator. I'm like, yeah, they were all the champions of their previous organizations. That's why they were brought in here is I was supposed to be their stepping stone. And I was like, no, I'm not that person. Mm-hmm. Not that person. And people forget that. I've never had an easy fight. From day one, my very first fight was not, I mean, my my first, the first person I ever fought outweighed me by 25 pounds. The second person I ever fought had been fighting previously. I think she was four and two and was set to be the next champion. And I was just supposed to be her hand me fight. So they would hand her the belt. Didn't happen. And then my third fight's Valentina Shevchenko. Like there, Ooh. there's never been an easy fight. And I think people just realize, think that like, oh, I have a cush record. There's no, there's no cush. I've never been given a fight. I've always worked my ass off to get to where I am. And one, one thing about your career that I found really interesting, since you turned pro in 2010, like you fought every year, at least once, like you haven't missed a year. Like, what do you think you owe this like longevity and like health, 
you know, like being healthy and being, you know, constantly active too? Uh, I think the active is just my mentality is I always stay ready. I mean, even this fight is a short notice fight. I got a four week notice for it. Uh, the original opponent had to pull out because of an injury and they're like, Hey, can you do it in four weeks? Yeah, I'm in shape. I'm ready to go. I'm always in shape because my mentality is that there's somebody else that's been doing this since they were a child. That's going to, since four years old, they're going to turn pro at 18. Their starting point, they're already going to have more experience than I do having done this for almost 12 years now. And they're going to start off with more experience than me and be young and be healthy and all these things and have a different mindset into it. So if I don't constantly grow and evolve, then without a doubt, they're going to defeat me. So I have to stay in there because I have to stay ready. I have to grow and I have to always expand about who I am to make sure I'm the best version of myself. Okay. You, you've also fought in like technically two different generations of for women's MMA. I mean, you fought in the generation where, you know, Dana White was saying that you guys would never be on a card. You know, promoters weren't pushing for you guys. And now, even though this generation, like it still has a lot of work to be done, in my opinion, at least for how they market women. You know, mm -hmm. we're seeing the rise of like how many stars there is in women's MMA. Like, how do you see like, you know, how from when you first started to where women's MMA is right now? It's substantially different. I mean, when I look at the start of women's MMA, I can remember trying to get booked for amateur fights. And the reason I turned pro so quickly is because every time that we did a face off and I did promo pictures and did any type of media leading up to an amateur fight, they would pull out. And so every, it was like, I was getting booked every weekend and then it was getting canceled every weekend. And so finally my coach is like, Hey, if you're taking all these, all these risks and you're going out there, why not just go pro? Let's just do it. At least get paid for it. Even if it's a hundred bucks. And even like, most people, you'd never see women as the co-main or main event on any fight card. Most of the time, they didn't make it out of the prelims. And it was just kind of like pushed off the side. There was no media buildup for it. And then you look today where women are the ones headlining cards. A lot of times, that's when people tune in the most because they're most exciting cards. So we go out and give everything we have. You see the ample skill set. Even the skill set of the women that were fighting before does not compare to today. When I looked at it, I was kind of embarrassed for women because I felt like they were super sloppy, especially the heavier the weight classes went. Now that's not the case. It, whatever weight class you look into, the women are exceptional for what they're doing. Mm -hmm. And let me let me ask you, because you fought for Invicta, do you feel like you need, like there needs to be more Invictas or do you think like these organizations just need to realize like what the value that women actually do bring to the, the organization and the, and the sport as a whole? I think both. I think that Invicta is a great platform for starting women off. It goes from that being those local venues, those super tiny shows to that next route right before they go into the big time with Bellator and with the UFC. So we need more of those around the nation to give opportunities for people that can't quite travel to get there and can't quite do those things. Uh, but at the same time, it's also just a matter of the organizations taking recognitions for what the women are doing in the sport. Okay. My last question for you, because I do appreciate this time. I mean, you were one of the big names that like left the UFC to go to their competitor in Bellator. You know, I've, I've, I've seen more organizations like, you know, one FC, uh, PFL, you know, Bellator keeps growing and growing. Do you think this mentality that once existed where fighters thought like the UFC was like the end all be all, like that's the only place that we can make it to become famous or successful or make money. Do you think that mentality has changed amongst fighters that the UFC isn't just the only one? Not quite. I mean, still through and through when I talk to fighters, like, oh, I'm like, well, what's your dream? What's your ultimate dream? She's like, to get in the UFC. I'm like, so to get screwed a lot. <laughs> but, you know, like I tell them, it, if the UFC is where you, where you want to go, then talk to the other UFC fighters, get their experiences, talk to those that have been in the UFC. For some people, like, I mean, I talked to Alima and, and from the get go, she saw my experience in the UFC. She went with me to fights. We've talked about it. And I've asked her multiple times. She's like, I don't want to go to the UFC. She's like, I get taken care of in Bellator. They treat me so well. Why would I want to go to the UFC with you? Nope, I'm good. Okay. And then like me going to corner her for Bellator, I was like, you're right. Bellator is really nice. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I hope that more and more people start to see the benefits of fighting for places like PFL, LFA, 1FC, and really for Bellator. Yeah, I mean, it, it does help, I think, the, the level of competition, at least, because for a while, it definitely seemed like UFC was a little monopoly, like it was it was cornering everything that existed. But I feel like, you know, with the PFL, especially with the, the million dollar tournament and the way that they structure fights, it's it's I think it's helping the sport a lot because it's, it's very exciting watching something like the PFL tournaments. 
Yeah, when you get to see where they do, uh, like Carissa Shields had just fought uh, mm -hmm. and when they show the speed of the punches compared to the males and things like that, like that's that's you know that's exciting. You want to see like whole. 19 miles per hour whoa that's crazy like yeah. can you run 19 miles per hour a punch is going that fast you know th those stats when they show them is is the science that they're putting behind it at least for me i know is exciting and for other people seeing that for format is and when they get like bell turn they're like oh i can just tune on on showtime and i can watch you guys i don't have to do a pay-per-view or try and find this app to that app and it changes this week and bell tour is really easy to access and it makes it so much more accessible to the fighters and to the fans right all right liz well i appreciate this time you know like i said it was an honor i'll be watching tuning in this friday hopefully watch you get your hand raised i wish you all the best of luck and thank you again for talking to me thank you so much all right you have a good day you too